Welcome to our sixth presentation covering module two. Um, as I said during the fifth presentation, this module is also really important. So um, of, of the first several modules that we've done, definitely this one and the one immediately before it are uh, the most important to understanding the heart of employment law. Uh, this one is going to repeat many of the things we've already seen. It's focusing on the disparate impact and disparate treatment theories, causes of action. I call them the desperate disparates um, because of a, of a funny experience that I had. I had a client once who um, I was explaining to him the difference between disparate treatment and disparate impact. And he misunderstood what I said and he thought I was saying, desperate treatment and desperate impact. But you don't have to be desperate to be involved in disparate. Uh, disparate it means different treatment. Um, and so when you uh, give somebody disparate treatment, it means you treat them differently than you treat other people. And disparate impact says you have the same standard, but the result of that standard is different for different folks. And we'll go through some examples so that will hopefully make a little bit more sense as we go forward. There we go. Okay, so we're looking at disparate treatment first. And here, of course, is one of the terms uh, that is definitional for us. Um, and this is a really, really important term. This is actually what most employment discrimination cases are about. We also have disparate impact, but disparate treatment is the rock star here probably 95% of all discrimination matters allege disparate treatment. So this is treating similarly situated employees differently because of some protected category. So that would be tr treating men differently than women or treating Caucasians differently than African Americans or treating Lutherans differently than Episcopalians. Um, so when you are focused on that protected category, and you treat people differently based upon that protected category, that becomes disparate treatment. When we talk about employment discrimination, most of us think of disparate treatment. That's, you know, again, it's kind of the, the, the immediate thought one has. Oh, if you are discriminating against somebody, you're treating them badly because of their race or their religion or their age or their ethnicity. So that's what disparate treatment is about. An example of disparate treatment is back in the day in the early 20th century, uh, when there were lots of Irish immigrants in New York City, they would have signs, Irish need not apply. We're not gonna hire you no matter how qualified you are, simply because of your ethnicity. People don't put out signs like that nowadays because they're unlawful. But um, it doesn't mean that people's hearts are necessarily different. Uh, many people have to, uh, uh, maybe the inclination to discriminate, even if they maybe are a little bit more cagey about it. Disparate treatment applies, though, even when the person does, isn't aware of his or her tendency to discriminate. A lot of people who have uh, more subtle forms of racism may not even be aware that they're a racist. There's lots of studies out there that indicate, for example, or a sexist or religionist or whatever the category is that uh, people who have, uh, for example, applicants who have names that many of us uh, might identify as more likely to be African-American, um, those individuals sometimes do worse um, in terms of the number of interviews they get than somebody who has a name that might ordinarily be identified as uh, Caucasian or white. Um, even though the qualifications might be the same, uh, people have ideas about uh, what that person's like simply because of his or her name, simply because of their expectation about this person's race. Now, the people who engage in this discrimination probably are completely unaware of it in most cases. In fact, they would probably argue strongly that they weren't racist. But again, the proof is in the pudding. The actions speak louder than the, the person's comments. We'll talk about disparate impact a little bit later, um, but we're gonna focus right now on the disparate treatment, and that's by far the more important category. Before we go any farther, we've been throwing around this word discrimination like we all knew what it meant. 
Um, but you know what? Discrimination is not always a bad thing. You may have heard the expression, he has a discriminating palate, meaning he can tell subtle uh, differences between uh, flavors. I mean, that would be a good thing. If he can tell there's a trifle too much salt in that dish, or that dish is just the perfect amount of sweet, or maybe he can see that hint of red wine in the sauce. Those would be examples of a discriminating palate. There's lots of types of discriminations that are perfectly legal. For example, it's completely lawful for an employee to discriminate against workers who come to work late every day. It's entirely appropriate for an employer to discriminate against workers who don't work very hard or who um, are rude to customers or who uh, steal from it. In fact, those are, are good qualities. We want employers to differentiate conduct and reward the hardest working employers, reward the employer, employee who's always on time, reward the employee who goes the extra mile for customer service. Those types of distinctions are based upon performance and those are completely lawful. But when people use the term discrimination in the employment context, they don't mean that kind of distinctions. What they're talking about are the unlawful types of distinctions, the ones that are not performance-based. So they are saying um, the employer is making a distinction that doesn't affect the job performance of the person. The, the employer is treating that person less positively because um, he or she is a woman or he or she is of a different religion or he or she is a different race. And that is unlawful. So when I use the term discrimination going forward, I'm meaning using it in that sense. Just keep in mind the word has a larger meaning out there in other circumstances. Okay, so here we have the prima facie case category. You may have noticed in the past we had five elements here. For this one, I've combined elements two and three into one element. But you see it's the same thing. The employee belongs to a protected class. Um, if the claim is race discrimination, the employee might be, um, can be white certainly, but could be African American or Asian or some other ethnicity. The person applied for or had a particular job. The person was qualified for that job. The employee or applicant was removed from the job or was not hired for the job. And finally, there's that other category. And here's an example of what can fit into the other category. If this is a, a higher situation, the employer continued to seek applications after the rejected candidates, after, uh, with the same qualifications that the rejected applicant had. So again, this is phrased as if we have an applicant situation but again, this could also be an employee who was dismissed or demoted from his or her job or was denied a promotion. We talked previously about direct evidence. I'm not gonna talk about that anymore. We also talked about circumstantial evidence. A particular category within the larger concept of circumstantial evidence is the comparative evidence. It isn't a smoking gun, but it is pretty significant evidence. If you didn't fire the white guy, why are you firing the Hispanic guy for doing the same thing? Now, there might be a good reason. For example, the white guy maybe had a lot, much longer service than the Hispanic guy. Or perhaps the white guy's in his job, um, whatever the failing was, isn't nearly as significant as it was in the Hispanic employee's job, uh, job performance. Or it could be that there's been a change in manager. And uh, this manager, the current manager, would have fired the white guy too, but that happened on another manager's watch. So just because you have a comparator that's different doesn't necessarily mean that it's a slam dunk winning case for the plaintiff, but it certainly is a very, very good fact. Now, of course, one issue that comes up with comparative situations is that most of the time situations aren't completely comparative. For example, if I, the white woman, uh, steals $100 from the cash register, and my colleague, the Hispanic male, uh, takes a paperclip home that belongs to the employer, 
I think we'd all agree that they're both very different circumstances. Yes, I suppose they're both technically theft, but we would all uh, condemn my behavior of stealing $100, and we'd probably look upon taking the paperclip as either forgetfulness or kind of a, a harmless little mistake. And so um, you have to make sure that you are really comparing apples to apples. Um, and of course, comparative evidence can work for both the plaintiff and for the uh, employer, depending upon uh, what the particular facts are. So now we're going to talk about the defenses that an employer might wage in response to a disparate treatment type argument. What can the employer say after the um, employee has been able to make that prima facie case? Obviously, prima facie case is an essential part of the disparate treatment case. So you have to do this first. Remember, we talked about the bouncing ball. The first thing we're going to have in a disparate treatment case is the prima facie case. And that's the obligation of the plaintiff. So the ball's in the plaintiff's court. Let's assume he proves this, and usually that's not too hard. Then the ball goes to the defendant's court. And then if the defendant rebuts it, it goes back to the plaintiff for one more go round. So let's look here at, at the, some of the things that um, the plaint that the employer might advance. Um, I, I may have been a little bit imprecise when I talked about uh, a business necessity a little bit earlier. Uh, now that I'm thinking about it, I, uh, what I said wasn't 100% correct. Business necessity has to do with um, Basically, what the employer is saying is, yep, I did what you said, but I needed to do it because of, of business reasons. And so it's okay that I did it. Um, you can never have a business necessity in a disparate treatment case unless there's a BFOQ. And we'll talk about BFOQs in a few minutes. BFOQs, we'll talk about what that means in a few minutes. So just kind of put a little question mark in your mind about that. Um, but that's usually not what the, uh, the uh, uh, employer wants to say. He's not saying, yep, you caught me, I did it, I'm guilty. Instead, he's saying, you're misconstruing the evidence. You are misunderstanding what happened here. And so the, um, so, so the employer presents a legitimate non-discriminatory non reason. So again, going back to our story, I am fired for um, uh, stealing the $100. I am, I feel like it's because I'm a white woman. So yes, I belong to the class of Caucasians. I belong to the class of females. I already had the job and I was qualified for the job as a salesperson. So two and three are satisfied. I was dismissed from my job. So that worked out. And we can say that the Hispanic person was retained in that position. So we satisfied all, and the Hispanic man was retained in the position. We satisfied the prima facie case. Well, what is the employer going to say? The employer is going to say, there's a huge difference between a paperclip and $100 in cash. And you know what? I think the jury is going to buy the employer's distinction uh, that is being drawn. Of course, then the employee gets to counter and say, oh, that distinction you're drawing is really just a pretext that if I had stolen a paperclip, you still would have fired me. Or if the Hispanic male had stolen $100, you would have retained him. And so, um, and maybe I have some additional evidence to support that. Um, and if I do, I'd obviously want to present that. If I don't, it's a pretty thin argument I'm advancing, to be honest. So let's consider this scenario. Bob is African American. He applies for a job at this company. He uh, is very qualified for the job. He does well at the job interview, but he's not offered the job. That happens sometimes, right? He, Bob doesn't know who the other candidates are. But after he, he, he was uh, turned down for the job, he knows he's no longer a candidate, he sees that the company is still seeking other candidates um, for the position. And so he's wondering, why wasn't I good enough for the job? And under those circumstances, Bob probably has the prima facie case uh, established. Now, it could be that he wasn't quite as good at the job interview as he thought, or it could be that maybe he wasn't as qualified as he thought. 
Uh, so part of the strength of Bob's case is going to turn out on who ultimately is hired. If Bob has um, maybe a master's degree, but they ultimately hire a PhD in chemistry, his, his uh, uh, credentials probably aren't as, as powerful. Um, or if he, or uh, Snapping Turtle hires someone with more work experience than Bob, or more uh, experience specific to the particular job that Bob was applying for, then those might be indications that Bob's case might be weaker. Not because the prima facie case isn't satisfied, Bob has all of these elements, but that the employer's response to the prima facie case, the, its legitimate non-discriminatory reason would be stronger if the ultimate candidate was um, more qualified. Now, obviously, if Snapping Turtle ends up hiring an African-American, well, then uh, Bob's case is pretty weak at that point. He's not going to be able to really prove number five very effectively. So I'm assuming for this case that somebody other than an African-American is hired. Okay, so let's talk about BFOQ. That stands for Bona Fide Occupational Qualification Defense. Uh, you may have heard the word, this is pronounced as bona fide. Um, usually in the law, we, we separate them and capitalize this F. A lot of times in ordinary English, we make this all one word without a capital F. Um, and usually when we pronounce it in um, uh, legal context, we do pronounce it final E. So it becomes the, the Latin way, bona fide. But either way, it means the same thing. Um, the legitimate or genuine uh, reason for the decision. And, and sometimes there are requirements that um, might be specific to a gender or a religion. For example, let's say I were an infertile and I wanted to hire somebody to carry my child. Um, well, if I were to interview men for that job, most of us would think that I'm pretty stupid, right? You have to have a uterus in order to gestate a baby. Men don't have uteruses. So I'm not discriminating against men by insisting that I'm only gonna hire women. Um, let's say my child is very ill and the doctor says that uh, breast milk would be the, the, a, a good way to uh, protect my child's health and let's say I'm unable to breastfeed. Well, if I hire somebody to breastfeed my child, again, I'm going to want to hire somebody who is a woman. And I'm also going to want to hire somebody who is, uh, obviously, is, has recently given birth. And so therefore, she's not going to be 60 years old, right? Um, and she's probably going to be under 40 or at least under 45. Um, and so under those circumstances, it sounds like age discrimination. Um, it sounds like gender discrimination, but it really isn't because of the particular requirements of the job. Similarly, if I'm a, uh, a theater company and I want to hire somebody to play the role of Juliet in a play, I'm not going to hire a 70-year-old man to play Juliet. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, very likely, I won't even hire somebody who isn't uh, who doesn't look Italian, right? Because Juliet in the play is Italian. So um, I wouldn't probably hire somebody with blonde hair and blue eyes. I wouldn't hire somebody who is um, ethnically Japanese or ethnically um, African, for example. Um, that, that those choices, I mean, sometimes you'll see that the casting directors make creative choices in these areas, but you could see how a casting director might not choose to make uh, uh, unexpected choices in those areas. So these are examples of BFOQs. As you can probably see though, there's, um, there's more than the ones I mentioned, but there's not a ton more. The vast majority of jobs do not allow for um, a BFOQ. And you can never have race as a BFOQ. There is no um, aspect of a job that requires somebody of a particular race. So those are unlawful. You'll sometimes see this in the area of religion. Uh, for example, let's say that I happen to have a meat company or a butcher company, and I want to sell to uh, people of the Jewish faith. Um, well, one of the things that is required uh, for people who keep kosher is that certain procedures are followed in terms of how 
the animal is slaughtered and how uh, the animal's uh, body is treated after death. Um, all of those tasks a non-Jewish person can do, but one aspect of the kosher process is that a, a, a Jewish rabbi has to supervise all of these steps. Um, now, a Lutheran or a, a Mormon or a, a, a atheist could follow all the steps just as easily as a Jewish person, obviously, um, but because there is that component to defining something as kosher, a devout Jewish person isn't interested in a Mormon confirming that the, the Jewish laws were followed. Again, it's a necessary component that it be a Jewish rabbi. As a result, then, I am permitted to limit the hiring for this supervisory position to a Jewish rabbi. But again, there are very few positions like that either that, that are religious specific. Let's consider this example. Bob is uh, applying for a job in housekeeping. He's rejected because this particular job involves primarily maintaining the ladies' restaurant. Um, it isn't unusual for men to uh, clean ladies' rooms, bathrooms. It's not unusual for ladies to clean the gentlemen's facility. Um, but you could imagine a situation where um, uh, companies wanted to keep that separation there. Um, I don't know for sure this BFLQ would fly, but it's certainly a possible one that would fly. Before you fly, before you, you attempt a BFOQ in this area though, I'd probably do a little bit of research to see if there's case law in my jurisdiction that would support this use. Okay, so we've talked about disparate impact, I'm sorry, disparate treatment. Again, the, what, we, what most of us mean when we say employment discrimination. We're done with that discussion for now, although this is again going to be the single most important topic in our course. Um, but now we're going to talk about disparate impact. And actually this kind of came up already when we were talking about the Hazelwood case. That probably is a disparate impact case, although you could argue it's a disparate treatment case. Let's first of all define the term. So we have here another vocabulary term for our list. And this is the de deleterious effect of a facially neutral policy on a group protected by Title VII or whatever the law might be. So the policy is neutral, but the, the way this neutral policy affects various groups is different. Um, and it may be that whoever developed the policy wasn't even aware that it would have this negative effect. May have been, the, the, the policymaker may have been completely oblivious. Or he may not have been completely oblivious. It can happen either way. But one thing about disparate treatment is it doesn't require an evil mind. It doesn't require that anybody sat back and thought, oh yes, I get to discriminate now. No, not at all. In fact, that's usually not an issue. But the ultimate effect of that policy, even when it was innocent, may discriminate against a certain group. And so therefore, it's still a violation of the law. So let's consider the term facially neutral policy. This is a specific workplace policy that applies to everyone, employees, applicants, or whatever. So here's an example. A an employer has this policy. Promotions to supervisor about the typo, and hire are limited to individuals with at least a bachelor's degree from an accredited university. Let's assume that this employer consistently always applies this policy. There's no exceptions. Nobody has been promoted in this facility who doesn't have at least a bachelor's degree. There is no inconsistency. It's 100% the case. So it is an absolutely facially neutral policy. Let's even go a step farther and say that the employer has routinely promoted minorities like African Americans and Hispanic individuals. Um, but it is still most likely a policy that has some disparate impact because in our culture, unfortunately, uh, certain educational credentials are more likely to be available to people who are Caucasian. Uh, a higher percentage of the Caucasian population has a bachelor's degree 
than uh, the Hispanic community and then the African American community. Of course, this distinction is largely due to the fact that the Hispanic and African American communities are usually less affluent and have less access to education. So it's not that they don't want education, it's not that they're not trying to get it, but it's a difficult thing for them to acquire. And so you can see when maybe the workforce is, we'll say, 20% African American and 20% Hispanic, 60% Caucasian in a particular part of the country. But it may be that 80% um, of the people that have um, advanced degree, amongst the, the population of people with bachelor's degree, 80% might be Caucasian, 10% African American, 10% Hispanic. So when the, um, uh, uh, the uh, employer seeks to fill the position, he or she is going to get eight Caucasian applications for every African American application and every Hispanic application. You do the math, you can see how, yes, sometimes African Americans and Hispanics will be higher, but they'll certainly be hired at a less uh, numerous rate than um, the uh, Caucasians will be hired. So you might be thinking to yourself, but isn't that exactly what you talked about when we were talking about Hazelwood? If you had that thought, you are being very, very clever here. There's an important point that I want to make. I'm just going to flip back to Hazelwood and flag this for you. But the important question was qualified. Well, who is qualified for a job? In this case, in, in the public school system, typically teachers have to be certified. So it's really easy to know whether someone is qualified or not. I mean, there's a database. And those individuals typically have to uh, earn a certain uh, credential from a four-year school. And oftentimes, they have to pass one or more tests. If I don't have that education credential and or I haven't passed the test, I won't be on the list of people who are eligible to be hired into this position. And the school district usually doesn't have much discretion. Um, that's somewhat changed now. But, but back in 1977, they wouldn't have had discretion to make exceptions to that policy. It, even if the best teacher in the world came to them and said, hire me. Well, if you don't have the credentials, we can't hire you to be a teacher. So the qualification wasn't something that this particular school district controlled. The state of, I'm guessing this is Missouri, but the, whatever the state is controlled that. But in this case, we don't have the state telling anyone who is qualified, the employer is making that decision. Remember, this is an employer policy. This isn't a state policy. And so when the employer decides who's qualified, the question remains, well, I mean, the employer could have said, any in promotions to supervisor and hire are limited to individuals who have at least two PhDs. We'd all look at it and go, well, that's ridiculous. Why would, um, number one, almost no one has two PhDs, and why would somebody who has two PhDs be applying to be a supervisor somewhere? That doesn't really make sense. Presumably, they'd be in academia, right? Um, or maybe in a research facility. And so we'd look at that and go, that's a crazy qualification to have for, th for this particular position. Um, so you can't just make up qualifications and say, yep, our person needs to have that. Uh, let me give you another example. Promotions to supervisor and hire are limited to individuals who have a medical degree. Again, unless this is a hospital or something, why would you need a medical degree to be a supervisor? Um, doesn't make a lot of sense. And so the question is, is this qualification, bachelor's degree, really necessary for the particular position? Um, let's look at the Griggs case to get a little bit more insight into this. This is also a really important case. We're, we're getting at the big one. We have gotten Burdine, and we've gotten uh, McDonnell Douglas, and now we have Griggs. And Griggs is called Griggs. That's certainly the most important name. Those three cases, it's hard for me to think of um, any other cases that are more important to the employment discrimination area. 
Um, this one I am going to talk a little bit about the facts of the case. Um, the, um, the issue is, did the employer's internal transfer policy violate Title VII when its standards were not related to job performance? And it did violate. This is a yes. Okay, so again, we're looking at probably the events about which Mr. Griggs complains um, happened in the 1960s. So we're, we're in fairly distant past. Anyway, Mr. Griggs was a worker who worked for Duke Power Company. Duke Power Company is one of the public utilities in North Carolina. And um, he did not have a high school diploma. Uh, nowadays, uh, it's more common for people to have high school diplomas than it was back then. Um, and certainly in the African American community at that time, many folks had to go to work before they were able to get their high school diploma. Um, my uh, two grandmothers, well, neither one of them is African American. Um, they're actually both passed away, so neither one of them were African American. But neither one of them got a high school diploma because one went to work when she was about 16 and the other uh, stayed at home after her mother died to care for younger children. So again, things that we wouldn't even consider uh, uh, happening in, in the 21st century would have been things that would have been considered necessary and appropriate uh, back in uh, earlier years. I don't know Mr. Briggs's age, but my guess is he may well have been in a similar situation. Of course, back then, um, while certainly not all Caucasians had high school diplomas, it was a more common credential that uh, Caucasians had than African Americans had. Again, having to do with the fact that uh, the economic realities were much more favorable to Caucasians than to African Americans at this time. Anyway, he filed a class action against his employer for alleged racism. And he, he, what he found unfair was that for him to transfer to a particular job, he needed to have a high school diploma. Well, he's at high school. He wasn't ever going to go back to high school because he was an adult at this time. And he felt he didn't need a high school diploma to do whatever this job entailed. It was a qualification that wasn't relevant to it. So he was saying, this is covert racism. Uh, the, my employer knows that Caucasians are much more likely to have the credential and, uh, and they want to promote uh, Caucasians over African Americans. Um, so that was his argument. Now, if it had been the case that Duke Power Company had consistently applied its policy and had also excluded Caucasian workers who did not have their high school diplomas from promotions, I don't know that Griggs would have won them. But Duke Power Company was not only applying a rule that was unnecessary, it was not applying it consistently. In fact, it had promoted Caucasian employees um, without high school diplomas um, in a way that was inconsistent with this policy. It followed the policy when African Americans applied. Sometimes it didn't follow the policy when Caucasians applied. So you can see that the real truth here was Duke Power wanted to prefer to, to promote um, uh, Caucasians. That's the bottom line. Now Duke uh, did a little dance here um, and said, well, um, we need workers who are uh, well educated because there are dangers associated with a power company. Power lines can go down, there can be outages that can negatively affect the people in the community. And so uh, we need a sophisticated, knowledgeable workforce and that high school diploma is going to mean that things are safer. And again, maybe that argument would have fl flown if Duke had consistently applied the policy to Caucasians, but it didn't. So Duke, uh, Duke was uh, frustrated by its own failure to follow its policy. So this is what the U.S. Supreme Court said. The first thing, and this is important to acknowledge before we get to the main part, is nothing in Title VII stops the use of tests or measuring procedures like educational qualifications. But what Title VII does stop is giving those devices or mechanisms controlling force unless they are a demonstrably reasonable measure of job performance. Well, obviously, even Duke Power didn't think the high school diploma was a demonstrably reasonable measure of job performance because it didn't use it consistently. 
And just like my requirement that all supervisors have a medical degree or have two PhDs, isn't a reasonable connection to the job. Now, the one that we actually had in this initial example, that whoever is promoted must have at least a bachelor's degree, is much closer to the line. It's a much more reasonable requirement than the silly ones I came up with. Uh, whether this one would fly or not is probably going to deter a turn on exactly what the supervisor or the uh, higher manager did. I would argue that though that this is probably not the best uh, requirement, I think it might be something that the employer could consider. So you might say something like uh, candidates with bachelor's degrees are preferred, uh, but I, I think having a, an on-off switch, meaning you're not going to consider anyone without a bachelor's degree um, when it is not something that is required like for a teaching certificate is usually a more aggressive position than legal your, your, uh, than the, 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 uh, the attorney probably would recommend but it's certainly better than, than the medical degree that I was talking about before so the next step that the court concluded was that any test that is used, be it a written test or a skill test, must measure the person for the job and not the person in the abstract. So it's uh, looking at that particular person's skill set. As a result, um, Mr. Griggs was successful in this case. So this is one of the reasons why you have to be very careful about the job requirements that you have. I mean, excuse me, the uh, uh, application requirements that you have, you have to think through those carefully. Does that person really need five years of experience? Does that person really need that advanced degree? Now, of course, if you're talking about hiring an attorney, yes, they need to be licensed, obviously. Um, but um, uh, if you're hiring someone to be a secretary, they may well need to type 65 words a minute. But do they need to know shorthand? Is that something that's really used in the office nowadays? Maybe so. You want to have evidence that that is still a practice that is used. But if it isn't used in the office, you probably ought not require it. Okay, let's talk about the uh, Dothard case. Um, and again, this is usually going to be called by the first name uh, Dothard. This is a U.S. Supreme Court from the same year as Griggs. It's less important. I'm sorry, it wasn't Griggs. What was the case? Um, maybe it was the um, Desert Palace case. Let's see here. No, no, Desert Palace. Hazelwood case, sorry. Um, I'd probably say Hazelwood is a little bit more important than Dawkins, but still, they're both pretty important. So the question here is, may an employer screen applicants based upon their height and weight if these screens have a disparate impact upon women? And the answer is no, usually no. No, usually. So in this case, Ms. Rawlinson, who's a recent college graduate, who weighed, I think, about 110 pounds, so she's a petite woman. She applies to become a prison guard. I think this was a male prison. Um, and she had the credentials that you would look to want a guard to have. She had, a ma she had majored in correctional psychology. When she applied, she was turned away because she did not weigh enough. She did not weigh 120 pounds. And so she said, well, gosh, there's lots of women who don't weigh 120 pounds, maybe uh, 20 or 30 percent of all women, especially young women like myself, straight out of college. Um, but the number of men who weigh 120 pounds is much smaller. Maybe that's only uh, 5 percent of men. And so this policy of requiring 120 pounds has a disparate impact on women. Uh, it might also have a disparate impact in other groups. For example, uh, racial groups who are smaller would have an advantage. So it might be, uh, actually would have a disadvantage because you have to weigh at least 100 pa 120 pounds. So for example, in the Hispanic community, it might be the case that um, a 10% of men 
uh, Hispanic men weigh under 120 pounds, but only 3% of Caucasian men and only 3% of African American men weigh less than 120 pounds. I'm making up numbers here, but you get the idea that I'm, I'm making. So it could, this idea is not limited just to sex. It could apply in many other circumstances. Anyway, so Rawlinson wasn't hired. She sued about this and ultimately got to the Supreme Court. And now again, we're looking at this business necessity argument. And again, I don't know if I've ever provided a good definition. If I haven't before, use this definition, the one in parentheses. And what the Supreme Court said is, you know what? We aren't correctional officers. We don't exactly know what's necessary here. And certainly we do think that people who work in that industry would be the experts. Um, it may be necessary that the correctional officials be of a certain height and a certain weight for everyone to be safe. And that kind of makes a little bit of sense. But you know what? Before you put that in effect, you're going to have to validate that requirement. After all, how did you pick 120 pounds? Maybe the right weight should be 130 pounds. Maybe it should be 110 pounds. Maybe um, instead of it being a particular weight, you ought to have some kind of obstacle course because somebody's 120 pounds might be 120 pounds of uh, tight muscle. A person who weighs 130 pounds might be flabby and uh, not able to um, do nearly as much physical things as a 120 pound person. It may not, that 130 pound person may not be able to lift as much or run as fast or um, do those other tasks. And so is it really the weight that's important? And I do wanna flag one thing about this, is my suspicion is that the state of Alabama, who of course is essentially um, the uh, defendant in this case, um, probably had no intention of discriminating against women. It probably didn't even occur to them when they initially came up with the standard that women would be applying for this job. Maybe, maybe it did, maybe it didn't. Um, but obviously, um, you know, they could have made this, the, 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 my guess is it wasn't uh, in, uh, uh, overt sexism that was driving it. But that isn't the standard. That isn't what the Supreme Court is looking at. They're not looking to kind of uh, read the minds of the people who came up with the test. Um, they, uh, what the employer needs to do if it wants to establish a test is that it has to prove um, that uh, uh, this is a necessary component. Again, I do have a video to watch for this one. One of those announcements is about two or three minutes long. You may find that interesting to watch. Um, so basically, this is the disparate impact case. This is the one that you'll see, and I have a few additional examples that we'll talk about in a few minutes. So a screening device is, again, this is a, a term to add to your Quizlet list. It's a way to uh, allow the employer who is reviewing applicants to quickly sort applicants. Oh, Bob doesn't have a college degree. Okay, well, we're requiring that here, so I can quickly sort all the people who have a college degree from the people who don't have a college degree. It makes it easier on the employer to figure that out. Or you might give all the applicants a test and everybody who scores at least an 80 goes to the next level. Again, it's an easy way to sort your populations. You can see the appeal that it is for the employers. And again, if the sorting mechanism is really related to the job performance, then it can be a good measurement. But of course, you're going to have to prove that it's related to um, the, the, the job. And, um, so that does involve an extra step before you have the screening mechanism. The four-fifths rule is a very controversial rule. Before we go into it, I'm not going to talk about the math in great detail, except to say that it's bad statistics. I'm embarrassed for our government for coming up with this. So I'm going to tell you what the test is, but I'm also going to tell you that it's not well-reasoned and um, I don't think there would be a lot of courts that would take it very seriously. So the fourth, four fifths rule is, and you can see four fifths is 80%, you know, four over five is like 80 over 100. So the four fifths rule is 
the minority group, so this is the group that is claiming discrimination, so group claiming discrimination, claiming discrimination, must do at least 80% as well as the majority group on the screening device or a presumption of disparate impact arises. So um, that's the rule of thumb. Now the statistical problem with it is it doesn't consider the number of applicants. If you had 10,000 African, let's say this, is, this group is African American, you had 10,000 African American candidates and 40,000 Caucasian uh, candidates, then an 80% test would be statistically crazy to do. You ought to be looking at, you know, a 97% test or something. On the other hand, if you had only two or three African American candidates and only five or six Caucasian candidates, an 80% test is probably uh, too strict to apply. So again, it, it doesn't consider the sample size when you're considering this test. It is a rule of thumb uh, that the EOC likes, or at least historically has liked, and so it can be a way when you establish your screening device and you see uh, the extent to which African Americans or women or Hispanics or whatever the group is is weeded out, apply the 80% rule, that can kind of give you a sense, is this, is this something I ought to be concerned about? Um, is, is my uh, device likely to be challenged or not? You can use both subjective and objective criteria to establish screening devices. An example of an objective criteria would be something like um, having the candidates run a, a mile race. And if your time is under eight minutes, you're, you are going to advance in the process. That is an objective standard. Or requiring a certain degree, must have a degree in chemistry, a bachelor's degree in chemistry for, to go forward in the standard, an objective requirement. Subjective requirements could be um, uh, had a, uh, a positive attitude during the interview process. Um, uh, uh, answered questions uh, in, an, in a non-evasive manner, uh, uh, gave complete answers to questions, you know, things that aren't uh, cut and dry that reasonable people could differ about whether that particular answer met the criteria or not. Obviously, the more objective the criteria is, the less likely it is that uh, pre-existing biases could affect how that particular candidate is evaluated. Um, you know, the, the stopwatch doesn't lie. If everyone ran the foot race, you can see who got to the finish line first. Even a racist person would be able to see if an African American was running faster than the Caucasian. But in the interview situation, that racist person might genuinely think that the Caucasian was a more impressive interview, even when most people looking at those two interviews will conclude no, I mean, actually, the African American was more impressive. So, uh, objective criteria are better for screening devices, but either can be used. We've already talked about the business necessity defense, and this also we talked about it with respect to the BFOQ, the bona fide occupational qualification, but it also can apply in a disparate impact situation. So, let's go back to Dothard's situation. We saw how um, the court threw out the 120 pound weight limit, but let's say that um, the state of Alabama had proven that yes, this was a reasonable uh, measurement stick. Um, it, it established some tests to see, maybe it has 200 correctional officers, and let's say it has some correctional officers that weigh under 120 pounds, and it put those officers through various um, uh, job skill tests that mimicked their actual work experience or crises that could develop in a, in a prison, you know, an escape situation, a riot situation, those types of things. And they found that, yeah, it really does look like 
the sweet spot here is about 120 pounds. If you weigh over that, you're going to do fine in the job. If you weigh under that, your performance is going to be significantly lower. And so if they had been able to prove that, it still would have a disparate impact upon women. It still would have a disparate impact upon Hispanics. But it's okay that it has that impact because of the business necessity defense. So again, this is a defense to a disparate impact case that is based upon the employer's need for the policy as a legitimate requirement from the job, even though it has a disparate impact. And again, the way to establish this necessity is through test validation. If a test is being challenged, the employer will need to have it already validated, sorry. And this is an important word. You can't wait for the lawsuit to be filed to validate the test. You have to have it validated already. Um, so here's an example. An employer uses a typing test um, that requires that the candidates type at least 50 words a minute. Uh, the uh, employer had already validated a test showing that the secretaries already employed who only type, type 40 words a minute uh, were not as productive, were not able to do as much of the work that they needed to do, which kind of makes sense. A faster type, this is obviously going to turn up, be able to turn out letters at a quicker pace than somebody who's a slower, type, slower typist. But let's say requiring a typing test for um, uh, a construction worker, would it make sense? Because construction workers typically don't have to type on their job. So that type of test isn't going to validate and therefore can't be used by a potential employer. We haven't talked much about the Civil Rights Act of 1991. We mentioned it briefly when we were talking about the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and said that it was amended, that statute was amended in 1991, and, but we didn't talk necessarily about what the amendments were. This was, um, this, this change in the law wasn't as dramatic, say, as Title VII or the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act or the Age Discrimination Employment Act or the Family Medical Leave Act. This is a kind of a second tier change, but this one was by no means trivial. It changed several aspects of Title VII. I'm not going to ask for you to know the details of what changed because after all, at this point, what does it matter whether that particular detail went into effect in 1964 or whether it went into effect in 1991? Either way, it's been in effect for a really long time. But this is one, ex one aspect of that law. And that law was kind of an interesting balancing uh, position. It gave several useful benefits to plaintiffs. And in fact, it made it in some senses much easier for plaintiffs to advance their lawsuit. Um, um, but it also limited one rather small area of litigation for plaintiffs uh, generally. So let's consider that one aspect. So you don't need to remember this is in the Civil Rights Act of 1991, but you do need to know that this is a law. Or that, yeah, this is a law you don't need to wear, but it is a law. And that is it is unlawful to have different cutoffs from t for tests. So let's say you have a test and there's 100 questions. You can't say, well, um, men who want to be eligible for promotion have to score an 80, and women have to score at least a 70. Or uh, Caucasians have to score at least an 80, and Asians have to score at least an 80, but Hispanics and African Americans only have to score a 70. If it's the same test, you have to have the same cutoffs. And so that is one thing that came from the statutory change. So it sounds like it was, it was a law that was negative for plaintiffs, but many of the other aspects of the law were very positive for plaintiffs. So let's, as we're considering a, a, a plaintiff in the spirit of Dothard, who is alleging that there is a disparate impact to a particular policy, the employer comes back and says, oh, but we validated this policy. It is a business necessity. Well, now the employee may come back and say, well, but you could have achieved that same goal in a different way. So instead of having a 120 pound weight limit, maybe you could have required all the candidates to do those particular tasks, run that obstacle, 
carry that weight that might reflect the, 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 the body weight of an unconscious inmate. Um, and uh, they, that person could have shown that they could handle those situations. And that policy might have been less discriminatory than having the weight um, requirement. So, um, you know, an example would be you could have your candidates, let's say you're hiring bakers, and you could say to the candidate, I write up an essay about how you would bake a cake. Um, but for a candidate who uh, doesn't have a gift for writing or maybe who is dysgraphic or dyslexic, that might be very difficult. They may be a whiz at making a cake, but they may not be very good at describing on paper how to do it. So probably a better way of getting this information is to put them in the kitchen and say, here you go, bake me a cake. And then they actually perform the exact task that they would if they were hired. And then of course, um, the, uh, the employer could taste the cake and say, hmm, not so good. We're not gonna hire you. Or great, you got the job. And, and this would of course, um, not if, if the candidate were dysgraphic or dyslexic, uh, their cake baking uh, prowess would not be affected by uh, those particular limitations. Okay, so this law firm wants to hire somebody who types at least 65 words a minute. Let's say that generally males type slower than females. I don't know if that's true, but for the sake of our argument, let's advance that argument. So a group of male applicants challenge this 65 word a minute requirement saying, hey, as a, as a class, men type slower, so this has a disparate impact upon males who want to work as secretaries. Well, my guess is that probably the law firm is going to be able to prove that fast typing is a very reasonable thing to want your secretaries to do. But let's say that instead of it being a secretarial opening, it was an opening uh, for a courier, somebody who runs papers uh, as kind of a messenger. Well, you probably don't need to type at all to be a messenger. And so I think in that case, those male applicants would have a good argument that this was a, a, a disparate impact case. In this case, there's a regional airline. They uh, carry, you know, they run smaller airplanes and they require that candidates be at least five foot, but under five foot eight. As you can see, this would tend to favor females as candidates. Almost all females are going to be 5'8 or shorter, but probably at least half or more of all males would be over 5'8. And so it would have a disparate impact upon males. Well, Bob is significantly taller than that. He's obviously a male. He says this has a disparate impact on me. Well, it's possible that the airlines would be successful at that, especially if it can point to the fact that its uh, aircraft is very small and uh, so it may need some smaller flight attendants, but it may also not be able to make that argument. That would be um, something that it would have to prove uh, whether that, uh, that requirement is a business necessity or not. So this is just kind of a silly. So Bob, he's from Scotland. He wants to go to work for Wolf Industries. He passes a test, I mean, he fails a test. And he says, hey, this isn't fair. Um, all the Scottish descendant test takers have failed this test. Well, he maybe is the only one if it's in that category. So all may just be Bob. And so he's saying that this test is discriminatory against Scottish people. And of course, Scott in Scotland, they speak English, so he wouldn't have any language barrier issues with respect to the test. And so he says, well, what, what this employer ought to do to fix this disparate impact is to have a lower passing score for Scottish people. But of course, we know from our Civil Rights Act of 1991 that you can't have different scores for different ethnicities or races. And so Bob would be out of luck. Of course, his argument is silly to begin with, but even if it weren't silly, um, the courts would prohibit uh, wolf industries from having different levels for different ethnicities. Um, so we've been talking here to, about defenses. We've talked about the business necessity defense. We've talked about the bona fide occupational qualification defense. Um, and um, 
Now, this isn't so much a defense to employment discrimination, but we just return to the fact that the plaintiff always bears the burden of proof. It's got to prove it beyond the 50% threshold. So if the plaintiff hasn't met that threshold, defendant wins. It's not, a, it's not really a defense. It's just uh, the plaintiff hasn't been successful with his or her case. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the topic of reasonable accommodation and exhaustion of administrative remedies. I've lumped these two things together, but they really don't have very much to do with one another, but I guess I didn't wanna to do too many headings. So reasonable accommodation um, is a duty um, under uh, both Title VII in religious cases and the Americans Disabilities Act. Um, so whenever somebody is alleging either disability discrimination or religious discrimination, the employer is required to reasonably accommodate that particular uh, situation. Um, and the employer is required to reasonably accommodate that particular situation up until the point that it becomes an undue burden on the employer. The language in the ADA and Title VII is, I believe, identical for this duty, in, even including the language about undue burden. Despite the fact that the language is essentially identical, courts have interpreted the language very, very differently. The duty to reasonably accommodate religious beliefs is much weaker duty than it is to accommodate disabilities. My theory as to why this, this difference exists between the same interpretation, same language, has to do with when these two laws were passed. Of course, Title VII was passed in 1964. We were starting out with this whole idea of employment discrimination. In 1963, for the most part, employment discrimination was perfectly legal. There were some, some problems with uh, sex discrimination, but, but certainly race discrimination was not unlawful, at least not on the national level. And so uh, when courts were looking at these issues, they were kind of used to, a, to more latitude for the employer to have. And so they, were, they interpreted reasonable accommodation in a more pro-employer manner, putting less of a burden on the employer than um, a court in later decades would do. Uh, the American Disabilities Act was passed in the 1990s. We had, had a lot of experience with employment discrimination laws at that time, decades of experience. And courts were much more willing to put a more significant burden upon employers. And so we have the same language, but we have very different result, results in terms of what the cases have done. We'll drill down more into those cases when we get to those chapters in the course. I've already talked about exhaustion of administrative remedies, but I don't think I provided a definition earlier in this presentation, and so, or in this module. And so exhaustion of administrative remedies means that the um, uh, potential plaintiff has to go through the EOC process filing the charge, getting the investigation, and getting that right to sue letter before he or she is eligible to file a lawsuit. So here's my scenario. Mary files a, a discrimination claim against her current employers, or wants to file one. Uh, she talks to her attorney. The attorney says, you got to file with the EOC first. She does so. She gets her right to sue letter. That's when she becomes eligible to file her discrimination claim not a minute before then. So now we're ready to finish module two, yay. Um, let's talk a little bit about some management tips. You know, we've been talking kind of gloom and doom in this section about all the things that can go wrong, but most of the time things don't go wrong and let's not forget that. Most of the time employment relationships begin on a happy note and they end on a pretty happy note. Um, but when something does go wrong, they can be very, very expensive for the employer, um, both in terms of the legal costs as well as potential damages that the plaintiff, the successful plaintiff can, to, can earn uh, through the court system. So it really does make sense to prevent as many claims as possible and uh, to make wise decisions. Even if things don't result in litigation, the morale problems that you have when you have discrimination in the workforce, uh, can really uh, be a, a financial drain on the organization. So an uh, ounce of prevention really does beat a pound of cure. Now, the things that I said I hope haven't discouraged you from uh, thinking that, oh gosh, employers can't hire the best person for the job. 
it's almost always the case that an employer can hire the best person for a job. Uh, that that's, you know, uh, assuming that the way you define best person isn't the best man for the job or the best Caucasian for the job, you can hire the best person for a job. And the law really doesn't impact that. But you do, offer, you, it is smart for employers to be aware of the hidden prejudices that they might have that might cause them to prefer a particular group or be more inclined to think that person is the best person for the job. Um, claimants must always be qualified for the job. If the claimant does not have the qualifications needed, then his claim isn't going to advance. He can't even make a prima facie case under those circumstances. Employers have to be careful to avoid retaliation claims um, by being careful not to retaliate. People should feel comfortable making complaints. Um, that's a healthy sign in the company where people feel it's safe to raise concerns that they have. And if you retaliate against those folks, then other people aren't going to be willing to raise those concerns in your organization. Employment decisions that happened in the past can become relevant to later employment decisions. So it's always a good idea to document what you did and why you did it. And as people leave organizations and as they die, and as they retire, and sometimes it's hard to know exactly why things happened the way they did. So if the HR manager has documented it, um, that can be very, very powerful evidence. And so a smart approach is to make sure that information is documented in a way that it will be retained. Um, those records can be very helpful in avoiding liability. So of course, if, as always, if you have questions, uh, don't hesitate to pop into my office hours. I'll be glad to uh, discuss any of these topics with you. I thank you for your attention and I hope you have a wonderful day.